All right, we will continue to have folks trickling in as we get started, but let's go ahead and start since we have a lot to cover today. Um, welcome everyone to the third installment of our Youth Partnership Spotlight series, this time for a fascinating discussion with Creative Resilient Youth or CRY. Uh, my name is Mark Houck of the Stonely Foundation. If you haven't heard of us before, Stonely funds fellowships for those working at the intersections of youth justice, child welfare, health and education with the goal of improving life for young people primarily in Philadelphia. We are also thrilled to support a group of excellent youth partnership organizations that are all youth led or youth centric and committed to growing the leadership and advocacy of youth in Philly. Our conversation today is focused on sharing the fantastic work that our youth partners at CRY are doing to support young people. Before I welcome our guests today, we will have time today at the end for an audience Q&A. If you have questions for CRY, you can submit them to us at any time by using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please include your name and organization in your message so that we can better respond to your question when we get to Q&A during the later portion of our event. Now, I'm excited to introduce our guest, Avani Alvarez. <laughs> Avani is a multimedia artist, mental health and youth advocate, teaching artist, and the current director of Creative Resilient Youth based out of Philadelphia. They are passionate about creating and maintaining third spaces, which we'll talk about today, in Philadelphia to promote healing, learning, wellness, and community amongst youth in Philly. Avani, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> of course. And so to get us started, and for those of us, you know, for those of us in the audience who have never heard of Cry before, can you start us off by telling us about the organization, its mission, and the work that you do here? Absolutely. Um, a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, Cry started, I want to say back in 2016, 2017. So it's been a couple of years. Um, and it originally started as an eight week program. Um, I was a part of the first co cohort of youth in the actual program before I stepped up to this role uh, this last year slash this year. Um, and cries all about um, <laughs> the best way I can describe it is cries all about um, supporting youth in their journey to, you know, adulthood through, you know, just being a young person in this world um, through the lens of art and through the lens of mental health and intersecting those. Um, currently, CRY is prioritizing this new model. We've gone through some iterations. Um, we're trying out a new model of learn, play, and rest for our staff and for the youth that we interact with because it seems like there needs to be a lot of spaciousness right now in this time. Um, in uh, in this coming year, we're hoping to implement a cohort of like 14 youth to come and learn with us, um, giving them the opportunity to explore topics of their choosing in a more hands-on fashion amongst their peers um, and hopefully cultivate an end of year project, which is in the usual fashion of Creative Resilient Youth. Um, also for some more context, Creative Resilient Youth is a hub for youth ages 14 to 24 um, to develop their art practices and engage in mental health care and community activism. Um, through a blend of youth-informed and directed programming, CRY provides new unique opportunities for young people to learn about past political and creative social change movements, to imagine and articulate past, um, excuse me, to articulate um, visions for healing centered and libertary worlds. Um, we also allow them to play with new art practices that prepare youth for, you know, world building and worlds that they're envisioning. Um, and we also try to be a space for youth to learn how to care for themselves, their peers and their community in a mutually supportive and generative way. Um, yeah, our current programming looks like um, art cafes. As I said before, we're hoping to, you know, slip into a new type of model of learn and play and rest. Um, our art cafes uh, happen every Thursday from 4 to 7 p.m. for youth to just float through. We have a lot of um, art supplies and a lot of amazing folks coming through, generating beautiful conversations around, you know, their lived experiences as youth, as youth in Philadelphia, as youth coming into adulthood. Um, and we get a mix of different folks because of our, you know, age range of 14 to 24. Um, and it's really, really special. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a little lot of it about growing. <laughs> no, that's a fantastic start, Avani. Thank you. And so um, I wonder, I know it's a new model. Um, you know, you might not be comfortable talking about it in too much detail yet, but could you give us a sense of like what the philosophy is behind the new model and, and maybe how it's different from yeah. um, when things ran previously? Yeah. So 
Um, the learn play rest model kind of came out of myself and uh, my, you know, co-conspirator uh, Mason, who isn't with us today, but um, is an amazing person to be friends with and work with and do this type of work with. Um, we found that we, we as staff developing this need a lot of spaciousness and in interacting with especially, you know, high school youth, we realized like they also need a lot of spaciousness right now. You know, youth are coming into, you know, back into high school, back into school, back into quote unquote normal life after the pandemic. And it's it's really hard and really traumatizing in some ways. Um, and it's hard to adjust to. So um, we were like, okay, we want CRY to continue its, you know, foundation of youth being able to learn about mental health, being able to learn about, you know, our practices and that, that those sort of histories. Um, but we also need to implement these moments of joy and rest because it's really important. I think that it's so important as a young person to un learn what joy is, you know, because I feel like <laughs> as an adult, sometimes it's very easy to get lost in the, you know, world of adulthood and like, you know, keeping a roof over your head and all of that. Um, so trying to allow, giving a space for youth to be youth and also slow, like be youth, but also feel confident in stepping into adulthood whenever the time is right, you know, like preparing them in that way, which is really sweet. And something I knew I needed when I was a young person, hence why I've stuck with the program this long. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that that is, and that is almost a perfect segue to our first, you know, major topic we're going to discuss, which is third spaces. But before I get to that, and I promise we will, um, <laughs> I just want to see if you could tell us a little bit more about how you blend, you know, the conversations and activities around um, art and mental health. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Great question. Um, I can speak more from my personal experience and how it kind of leads me to facilitate in this way, but. Sure. You know, I am someone who has had my own mental health struggles. Of course, I still currently do. Um, and I found that, you know, doing collage or illustration or writing um, poetry was a really, a really great way to cope with what was happening and to help me understand what was happening. I think that in my experience, I am not the best with language, even though I'm doing a mm -hmm. webinar. Um, but when it, when it came to my feelings when I was younger, it was so hard to speak how I was feeling to speak mm -hmm. these things. Sometimes it, you know, may not feel safe to do so. Um, and learning how to channel that through art allowed me to continue to be myself and continue to communicate with people and allowed me to slowly feel more comfortable being like, I can talk about my mental health struggles. And like, yes, they're displayed here, but also I can tell you about them. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, art and politics and mental health, all these things intersect in such a, uh, I want to say wonderful way, even though sometimes the circumstances that might be a little ill-fitting, but it, sure. it kind of is. <laughs> sure, no, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're going to get into all of that, I think. I, I'll try to save some of it for these later sections, because um, I know we, we kind of want to go through things. Um, so then let's, let's get back to the third spaces then especially uh, there's probably a lot of people on the call who've never heard of, you know, the concept of a third space before. Um, yeah. So for those people, could you tell us, you know, what is a third space um, and why are third spaces so important, not just for, you know, adults, but particularly for young people? Yeah. Um, well, in the basics of terms, um, a third space is a third space you go to as a youth, you go home, you go to school and maybe you go to work. So maybe it's third, fourth space, but usually when you're young, it's home, school, home, school. And, you know, depending on how either of those spaces are and feel and impact you, it is important to have another space to decompress, to, you know, be yourself, to be away from, you know, maybe the hardships of school, the hardships of home life, and just have another spot to exist. I know, you know, as adults, I guess we could call it a four or maybe a third or fourth space if you're also in school um, as an adult, but okay. it's important to have a place that is your home, a place that is your work and another place to, to be devoid of either of those things and to, you know, do something fun, do something restorative, do something relaxing. It's, it's of the utmost importance to have as adults and youth to have that, section it, it right. teaches so much about you know how to 
continue to, to continue to exist in this world, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit and then we'll come mm -hmm. back. So, you know, what, what is it that makes a third space? You know, we'll have people say, well, you know, schools are creating this programming that's relaxing for young people. You know, young people can relax at home with their families. Mm -hmm. How's a third space different from a home or different from a school or, you know, a place where you work? Yeah, I think what makes the difference is the pressures. You know, I think when youth are in school, there is a pressure of, there is always someone in authority watching over you, telling you what to do. And even if, you know, it is more lax, it can still feel that way because that's just the way that the institution and the environment is built. It is built to be less about, you know, I'm a youth and I have a voice and more of I have a youth and I'm a youth and I have to listen, you know. So having a third space to to have space to be a youth, to be your full self, you know, and grow into that is really, really important. Um, which may is not as accessible at home for some folks or at school for some folks, you know. Right. And so I want to pull back and talk about like, why are we even talking about this? And what, why is CRY, you know, so focused on creating this third space? You know, you and I have had several conversations about, you know, the disappearance of third spaces, particularly in Philadelphia, right? So we talk about, you know, the, the curfew that's now down at the mall on East Market. We talk about you know, the, the Free Library of Philadelphia, many of the locations don't have weekend hours anymore, right? It's, it's becoming harder for young people to find those third spaces. And it's like, sure, you could go to the movie theater, but the movie theater costs money, right? And so um, I don't know if you want to add anything to the context of the problem before we talk about like what CRY is doing to solve it. Yeah, problem. absolutely. Um, well, I mean, the truth is, um, in Philly, being a youth can often be criminalized. Like straight up, that's what it is. I mean, even when I was in high school, I couldn't go into the mall because I was young. And, you know, back in the day, like my mom would go to the mall to have fun with her friends. Like it, it wasn't an issue. I think youth have so much energy. And I sometimes I don't like this phrase of like, youth have a lot of energy. They just need to put it somewhere because it's there's so much more to it than that of them sure. just like having energy and, you know, pushing it out in these types of ways. But um, when you take away, you know, the safety around schooling, because now a lot of schools, especially in Philly, kind of run uh, close to systems that are not so, you know, youth friendly um, and, you know, set specific environmental standards for youth walking into the space, you know, like metal detectors and like you got to be pat down and all this stuff like it, it doesn't, you know, it's not a comfortable environment to step into at seven in the morning. Um Oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought a little bit. No, that, I, I mean, <laughs> you're absolutely correct. You know, we we often hear from experts that schools are um, one of, if not the biggest contact point for young people to, to come into yeah. contact with other systems that, you know, are trying to help them that may often harm them, right? So you talk about the youth justice system, uh, the child yeah. welfare system. There's just such a level of, of supervision and, and oversight there that there's that pressure, right? Yes. The pressure of, I have to be very careful about who I am, what I say and what I do because there's somebody watching and I'm not in control. And so yes. I think that takes us to what is CRY doing to create a third space for its participants? And how, again, is that different from, you know, let's say the movie theater or a school? Yeah, well, for one thing, CRY is incredibly accessible um, in terms of like, we're not charging you anything. If you are able to come to the space, you know, our building is, uh, for the most part, wheelchair accessible. Sometimes the elevator is up, but we, you know, say that very clearly. We provide food and tea. It's very cozy in our space. I think our goal is to make it eventually make it look like a very cozy living room for folks to be able to lounge in, you know, have space and community you know if they need to be alone we have a little corner for them to go into you know if they just need you know some moments to be by themselves um yeah i think in a lot of ways that's how we make our third space different we don't you know it's not us you know all right today we're going to be doing this everyone do it you know right, even right. sometimes we have <laughs> workshops of course but for the most part it's oh my gosh hey welcome in i'm avani like who, how are you doing today we always start our days with check-ins whenever anyone flows through um and we let people choose their own adventure um when mm -hmm. i was talking about our art cafes on thursdays we have a plethora of art supplies um in our space and we just allow folks to choose what they would like to do if they want to learn a new skill 
so ha- we're always so happy to teach them. Um, and it's been really fun teaching folks how to like crochet and knit. Um, and it, I think because of the environment that it is, because we make it so cozy and make it, um, we, I know as like facilitators, myself and Mason, we are from the gate, like very vulnerable with folks to set that mm-hmm. intention. Like this is a space where it's okay to be like, I had a bad day and I'm feeling a little low, but it's okay. Cause I'm here now and I will get through it. Um, and in doing that, it allows, you know, other youth, other um, folks to ease into that of like, oh, I can, I can be honest about how my day was. I can be mm-hmm. honest about what I'm feeling. Um, yeah. And I think, and I, I, you know, I just want to go back to some things that you said, like, I can't emphasize enough what we've heard from, from other experts, from fellows in our, you know, our network, like how much those little details matter, right? The fact that it's free, you know, the fact that it is not scripted, you know, there are so many other programs or places where those are major barriers to entry for young people looking for a place to go. You know, they, they might want to have, you know, some place for company or friendship and, but they're not good at sports. So they're not, you know, particularly interested in participating in the one thing that they have to do if they go to the right. place. Right. Um, and even just a small entry fee of a couple dollars is, is a lot for some people, for a lot of people, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, and, and so I just, again, want to emphasize, like, I think some of the, the, the most important thing that you all are doing is just like minimizing as much as you possibly can that barrier to entry. Um, like, yeah. I think we talked about, and I want to get back to this a little bit, like that drop-in model of, right, there, mm-hmm. there, people can just come by. There's not like, you have to be here at 3 p.m. to, yeah. you know, have people saying, well, I have a thing until 3.30, and so I guess I just can't be a part of this. And it's like, no, with the drop-in, mm-hmm. you know, you can, you can come whenever it suits your needs. I don't know if you want to say yeah. anything about else about that model and how it's worked out for you all. Yeah, um, so... For context, like Cry's never done a drop-in model before. We've always worked in, you know, um, one and two year cohorts of like, Mm -hmm. you know, eight to 10, 10 to 12 uh, youth uh, working towards, you know, an end goal of like an end of year exhibition. Um, And during that time it has always been, you know, learning about mental health and learning what, you know, um, avenues of that journey they want to, you know, dive more dive deeper into and express through you know whatever art medium or whatever project they want to pursue um so because we're trying to take a more healing centered approach instead of trauma informed um we decided you know let's cut the strings of all this stuff let's do a drop in It, it allows for more freeness in the programming it allows um some of the feedback that we got from our youth is that it felt like a lot you know, to have to, you have to be there at 4 p.m. every day. You have, you're going to be learning about this. You're going to be doing this. And in some ways that structure can be really, really great. But when youth are already experiencing so much of that structure, it can be, it can be a little hard. It can be like, okay, more of this awesome, you know, or I don't really have the capacity for this today. Like it's very, the drop-in allows us to hold more. Is the easiest way to say it. Like if you are feeling like I want to do everything this day, I want to paint, I want to crochet, I want to draw, I want to chit chat, you can do that. And if you come in next week and you're like, I actually just kind of want to sit and do nothing, we can also hold space for that. There is a lot of, there's a lot of openness in that. Yeah. Right. And again, you contrast this and I'm just, you know, kind of reiterating these things because I think they're so important, especially as we talked about them. Like, right, compare that to, trying to go meet your friends at the food court down at the mall now, trying to, you know, sit, sit in a park somewhere. It's just like, it's just so much harder than it used to be, Yeah. Than, you know, to do those things. And so I, I really appreciate the the kind of the openness that Cry brings to the, the model that they have, you know, providing food again, it's, you know, there, there are certainly many young people where um, that food is a big deal for them at their, their home yeah. or their school, right? That's another thing that might be restricted that they have more agency over when they come to a model like this one. Um, similarly, again, highlighting, you know, the difference in, in hierarchy and supervision, right? If you, if you can have any kind of program you want at a school, but ultimately there's a, a teacher or a principal or some adult in charge. And I think one of the things that makes Christ so unique is your um, commitment to a co-created model, right? Of, of meeting um, the young people or your participants halfway and saying, okay, let's create this together. Um, And so I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit more about the the co-creation process? um, Yeah. What that looks like and what it produces? Yeah. I mean, um, 
Bennett Kuhn, who was uh, used to be a facilitator, um, but now he's, you know, stepped aside to focus more on like and um, other amazing endeavors um, regarding mm -hmm. mental health um, advocacy. But he said that um, every student is a teacher and every teacher is a student. And I think it's really important in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll say it as it is ageism, you know, like there is a lot of stigma around youth not knowing a lot or not knowing what they're talking about. And I think that it's so important to like youth know what's going on. Like they're not dumb. They are very aware, especially nowadays, like they're very aware of what's going on. They're very aware of how certain things impact them and make them feel. They just don't have a place to say it, show it, yell about it, you know, cry about it, any of that stuff. Um, and it's really, really important to give them the space to do that. Um, yeah, I, um, yeah, some of the ways that we've, you know, implemented co-creation in Cry in the past and in the current is, as you said, meeting them halfway. What do you guys want to learn about? Um, in this, you know, learn model that we're hoping to implement in the next year, we're not saying you're coming to Cry this day and this day to learn about this and this they will give us what they want to learn. It's okay. Do you want to learn about mental health? Do you want to learn about this sector of activism? Do you want to learn about X, Y, and Z? Right. And we will gather from them what their interest is and they will lead that, that conversation. We will just provide the resources to, to, to give them that knowledge, which is what cry has always been about, which I'm forever grateful for. Um, because that, you know, it shaped me as an adult. <laughs> yeah, no, again, you're just giving me tons of perfect segues. So I think we want to get into it. You mentioned, you know, you're kind of in a unique position, right? You are now the director of Creative Resilient Youth. Um, and as somebody who, as you mentioned, you know, used to be a participant of mm -hmm. Creative Resilient Youth. And so as you're comfortable, do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like to be a participant, you know, to, to work with a group of young people as part of the program? Um, and then your, you know, your transformation, your transition now to to leading the program. Yeah, oh my goodness. It's so funny thinking about who I was when I first joined Cry. I, you know, didn't, you know, define as an artist by any means. I was very much in my people pleasing, you know, tendencies, yeah. you know, I was just like, I'll help everyone with their projects. I, I remember specifically, you know, we have to create, you know, an end of year show, an end of year project of some kind and, they, you know, the facilitators were asking me like, okay, Ivani, what are you going to create? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I, I think I'm just going to help this person with theirs. And they were like, no, 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 <laughs> you, you also can make something. You should make something. And they right. kind of very gently, but powerfully guided me to a place where I felt comfortable creating something for myself with, you know, myself and, you know, my community. And it was amazing. It was the first time I'd ever claimed to be an artist. The first time that I ever felt like, I had any autonomy, you know, in, in, in any given point in time, you know, I was like 16. So I was just like, I don't know, I'm just going to help everybody do whatever. Um, and, <laughs> you know, kind of from that moment on, it's just, I've not to toot my own horn, but I've kind of blossomed, you know, yeah, I, I'm, absolutely. I'm an adult, <laughs> which is yeah. a lot of fun. Um, and then I remember my, the next year I had moved to New York for uh, college um, but I had one, I came back for a show that I was involved in before I moved. And it was a piece about autonomy asking, um, we had a, an exhibit at Cherry Street Pier, and I had a wall that had a bunch of questions that I wish I could remember, but this was in 20, 2021. So it's been a couple okay. of years, but um, I still have all the responses that people on Cherry Street Pier, you know, wrote. Um, and it's, just this program has allowed me to really tap into my autonomy, but also my power in caring for community and that community care, which is, is it's so beautiful to have hold those two things, right? Like you can have autonomy and also have community and those both of those things can coexist. And I think the balance is that both of them exist. Like community should be a net yeah. that catches all different types of walks of life, you know, meets them where yeah. they're at. Um, and cries really show me that in a lot of amazing ways. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. Before yeah. we move on, is there anything else you want to say about 
Um, I'm just trying to formulate my thought here because I'm coming up with this question on the fly. You know, how, again, how you were received as a CRI participant and how that shapes how you, you know, interact now with the, the people who are starting out the program for the first time. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, because I, I was so shy or maybe not even shy is the right word, but I was so I was anxious to kind of come into myself you know, mm -hmm. in, in the world, in the program, in all of it, but approaching it with a lightness and not saying like, you need to do this. Because I think mm -hmm. if I, if I deep down was like, I really don't want to do a project, no one would have made me. Um, but it's, it's about giving that choice. And we always give you a choice, you know, and we're like, Hey, we think you would do really amazing work. But if you, you know, if you really feel strongly about not doing it, that's totally fine. And I think that Framing it, the way that we phrase, you know, our projects, our intentions to youth is what makes that huge difference because we're not telling you what to do. We're not telling you how to be. We are right. inviting you to be with us however you come. And doing that over and over and over again as the weeks go by, you see people open up in ways that you, like they never thought was possible. You know, we've, we've seen that in a lot of youth that have come through our program of them, you know, starting out incredibly shy, not talking. And then by the end of the year, they are like, hello, I'm here and I do all of these things and I'm great. And it's just, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's so wonderful. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Yeah, so then let's get to the meat of this conversation, right? There, there again, you know, we've talked about Stoneley's network is a little bit different than Cry's network. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people on the call who, you know, may have worked with young people a little bit, may not often be working with young people, maybe looking to support this work more. You know, what are the lessons that you've learned? And we talked to them about them a little bit already, but what are the, the big lessons that you've learned, you know, from your time at Cry? What are the lessons that we should take away from this conversation? The people who are mm -hmm. Again, learning about cry for the first time, learning about this model for the first time, you know, third spaces, the drop-in model, these low barriers to entry, this co-creation, this openness. You know, what would you say to folks who are all just kind of experiencing this for the first time? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, you need to trust young people. Like straight up, you have to trust young people. You know, I think the younger you are, the more clearly you see the world, you know, like I think a lot about how babies, when they cry, when they are hungry, when they are sad, when they, you know, need their diaper change, like they are like, I need this, I need this, and I need this now. I think, you know, as we grow up, we kind of fall out of that because of, you know, so mm -hmm. many different things. So it's really important to listen to young people because they are, they are, they are the most in tune with what is happening, especially to them, which is in turn what is happening to our future because youth are our future. Um, youth that are, you know, given a, a platform to be able to lead in that way is is so important for us, for, for them, for just, you know, everybody. Um, I think that, yeah, yeah, it's so important to trust young people. It, it can't be stressed enough. They they're brilliant. You know, they're so brilliant. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think we often think about, right, the difference, you know, between young people and adults. I see a lot of, you know, older adults are like, well, I don't really know. This is kind of the way we've always been doing it. You know, let's, yeah. let's just err on the side of caution. Let's just play it safe. Let's just continue to do this one thing the way that we've always done. And especially as a foundation, one of the things that I've admired about CRY um, is, again, just your commitment to continually evolving, to continually trying to do something new, to asking mm -hmm. for feedback. Um, I know that we've spoken a little bit. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about it more on here about, um, you know, cry engaging with an evaluation partner to say, okay, we're, we're changing this model, but we also want somebody, you know, we're getting, we're getting thoughts and ideas and co-creation from young people, but we also want, you know, the, we want to add rigorousness to it, right? We want somebody to come in and say that, oh, yes, this change is working. This change is positive for, for all of us. Um, and so I appreciate, you know, you kind of doing both, right? Committing yeah. to change and also to committing to make sure that that change is moving you in the right direction. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to say any more about that before we move on. Yeah. Um, at each, you know, in the past when Cry was doing cohorts and we plan to do it, you know, this year too, even with our drop-ins, because we do have a, a stream of regular folks coming through. Um, but um, there's always, you know, um, end of year reviews about the program directly from the youth. You know, like last year, one of the big things we got was 
I wish we would have taken more taken more field trips. So now in our current programming, we have it written in to take more field trips and do more fun things outside of the space. Um, um, you know, trusting young people, we take that very, very seriously. We take their voices very seriously and their concerns, and they are what has helped shape our program. You know, they they are this program. So if we're not listening to them and listening to what they need and what they want, then what are we doing this for? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it's been it's it, it's been a real treat. I think we're still in the process of like synthesizing all of the years that our um partner Sari Weidman um. She has been documenting all of our sessions, you know, with, you know, recorders, taking notes, all of this to see the the true effectiveness of our program and kind of write our little recipe, um, <laughs> you know, so we can like modify it and change it in little ways. So we're still in the process of um, like getting all of that um, together. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and again, just wanting to get back to like, right, this, this, uh, one of the things, again, I admire about you all is, is just your commitment, again, to, to engaging with young people mm -hmm. and, and giving them, right, we talk often about this, right, the difference between, you know, having like token youth involvement, where you're just like, okay, I'm going to ask a young person what they think, but I'm going to kind of keep them over here, right, I'm not going to let them make any big decisions. And like, if I don't like their idea, well, I'm going to be the final say, and I'm just going to override. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, compare that to, um, you know, I, we won't, we won't talk about your age, but you're obviously very young and you're the director <laughs> now of cry. Right. And so the commitment to putting, you know, young people or recently young people in positions of decision-making power, yeah. right? letting them have, if not the whole say, you know, an equal say in the decisions that are being made because they have such an impact on the, the participants, right? The, the young people yeah. should be able to be making decisions because they're also the participants. Yeah. Um, and so if you want to say anything else about that, we can definitely do that. And if not, we'll, we'll move on to the next section here. But yeah, again, I I'm just, just... want to emphasize that. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just reflecting on, you know, the beginnings of crying, thinking about how much it was really us doing it and then just the adults in the room being like all right we'll make that happen we'll do all the ad mini stuff you want you want you want all of this you want all of that cool we'll make it happen um and it, it it really i think changed all of the youth that were involved in that program you know throughout the years it is it has shaped all of us as adults who or just as youth who have grown up you know whether we're still youth or we're in adulthood now like that experience is 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 priceless, you know, because we had never had anything like that before. We had never had an environment where we were taken so seriously and our what we said went, you know. Right. Like, yes, we learned, you know, about mental health and we learned this, but we we knew going into that we were doing this because we wanted to learn about mental health and we wanted to create art in relation to that. Um, and so that being just the only thing and then whatever else you want to do, you can do. I was like, oh my gosh. It's like being in a candy store. I was like, oh my God, yes, I'll do all of this. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Right, it's that encouragement to get started. I mean, again, I'm just speaking from a little tiny bit of experience. We, we, we you know, obviously I've talked about our youth partners at the beginning of this, you know, every organization that we've worked with where they put young people in positions of decision-making power or leadership, you know, we've only seen positive results from that. It just it encourages, you know, young people to really um, take the initiative in that yeah. leadership in a way where if they don't have that decision-making power, um, you know, many young people will still try to, um, you know, make positive change regardless, but, mm -hmm. you know, many others will also be discouraged and just there'll be that gap between, you know, okay, this affects me and there's not really anything I can do about it. And so I'll participate, but I'm not going to be super thrilled about it. And I, yes. I just see a world of difference between those two kinds of organizational models. Yeah. Um, so then moving on, I think the other thing that we wanted to talk about, you know, we we often, um, you know, so many is guilty of this, you know, other, so many people in the city of Philadelphia um, are guilty of this, especially in the last, you know, several years with COVID and everything else going on, you know, as we, we all have a tendency to focus on, okay, what is the, what is the problem? What's the challenge mm -hmm. that we're facing? You know, uh, so many focused on young people. You know, what what is going on with young people? What what are the issues that we need to address? Um, we talk about violence and everything like that. Um, and I think one of the things that Cry does so well is is making space, mm -hmm. right, for for positive conversations, right, for joy and for connection. It's not to say that you know Stoneley or the others don't do that as well, but 
um, I think you all just put such a focus on it um, that it really, you know, highlights the difference between, you know, having a conversation that just is entirely oriented towards the negative, right? I've, I've have heard conversations of like, what's wrong with the young people today? What's going on with them? Let's, you know, that's all we're worried about. And if they're okay, we're not worried at all. Um, and, and so I know that you want to talk a little bit about, about how you can focus on the positive as well. Yeah. I mean, it's so important, it's, you know, cry started, we were so small, you know, we had, a you know, X amount of funding with, you know, eight youth, you know, we were just like making art and learning and becoming better people, which is great. And it, it sounds amazing. But I think, especially in terms of finding funding as, you know, a small organization, like we were and still are, um, it's hard, because, you know, it's hard to service as many people with the amount of staff that we had. And, you know, we still have small amount of staff and have such meaningful meaningful connections. I think it's also, it's so important to fund joy and connection in that way. Um, you know, the world has changed so much since COVID started, as you said, and so many of us don't have the capacity that we used to. And I think that there is so, there's so much around like, we need to get back to normal. We need to get back in the groove of things. How about we just take a moment to like breathe and maybe be a little happy, which may may sound like very, very like, okay, whatever. But it's it's there's a serious need for it, you know. There is there are so many people out here that will hold you, that will, you know, care for you in this way. There's so many programs out here that will do that for youth, but um it's hard to do that given the constraints, you know, so many, so many organizations, cry included, want to, you know, perpetuate joy and connection. Of course, also learning, of course, all of these things, but learning is a fundamental, or not, excuse me, learning is a fundamental part of being a human being, but <laughs> joy is too, you know, Absolutely. joy and navigating, navigating outside of that, because of course we can't be happy all the time, but you have to be able to hold those moments of happiness, those moments of sadness, those moments of contentness, those moments of anger. Um, and it's important to fund, you know, organizations, people, places that are trying to do that work for youth. Because it's how many, as adults, it's so hard to like figure out your emotional baggage. You know, it's so difficult trying to do it as an adult. And imagine a world where youth were already equipped with that at a young age. Right. I mean, Right. It would be incredible. It would be it incredible, would. you know, <laughs> and it would allow youth to, you know, communicate with each other much better, communicate with the, just, I don't know, it would just allow, mm -hmm. I think it would make everything better personally, but <laughs> maybe that's just Absolutely. me. Um, yeah, I think that it's, it's so difficult because I hear so many from like other facilitators and organizers that are doing such amazing work, but they're struggling because they can't find funding because it's not like we are you know focusing on a specific problem we're trying to solve mm -hmm. that problem it's like we mm -hmm. just want to give youth a space to be youth and sometimes that's not it. most times in fact I'm not gonna even say sometimes most times that's not enough to secure funding to allow youth to be youth and in a world where that is being criminalized in a world where spaces that allow youth to you know be free have fun sit in a park whatever those places are being destroyed and being replaced right. with other things. Right. Um, it's it's so important to fund this type of work. It's I mean it's incredibly important. Right, and we're talking about things that don't fit neatly into a grant application or an application. Yeah. For else, right. It's it's they're, yeah. they're they're often difficult concepts to quantify, and, and so that makes it difficult. Like again, we get back to like the criteria for a young person to participate in cry and I think it's very minimal, right? It's, it's, it, it, there's, you know, there's an age range that you're looking for, but um, I think you all would be flexible with that as well. And then there's not like a, right. Oh, this, this bad thing had to have happened to you in order to participate. No, not at all. It's just, you know, are you a young person? Are you, do you identify as an artist? Do you care about art? Are you interested in learning about art? Do you care about mental health? Are you curious about learning about mental health? Come join us. And I think you know. we would say that's most young people, right? And you, as you even said, right, you don't even have to identify as an artist. You can just come because your interest is peaked and yeah. you might find out, you know, while you're there that you are actually an artist. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> when you're young, like, I'm going to be, like, young people know a lot, but also you're still figuring out who you are. And even as adults, you're still figuring out who you are, you know? Right. So having 
you know, framing it in that way of like, you don't have to definitively know, you know, I want to be a mental health advocate. I want to be an activist. I want to be an artist. You don't have to know those things. You can come here and experiment, which is another thing that youth aren't afforded, you know, right. like they aren't afforded that in school most of the time um, in a lot of these spaces that, you know, are dwindling. Um, so it's, yeah. Right. It's there are so often so many programs that are trying to trying to teach people, young people, how to do the right thing, whatever they might think that might be, right? Right. And so again, right. getting back to like, you know, not only are the young people co-creating, but they're co-defining. But what, so actually I do want to say one more thing and then we'll move on, I know, because we're starting to run out of time here, <laughs> is that um, one of the things I found so fascinating about your, your application, your pitch for what CRY is, is that you work with young people for them to define for themselves yes. what mental health and wellness and well-being is. And I think many adults, or at least myself, you know, before I read that, um, would say, well, no, there's one, there's kind of one definition of health. You're either in good health or you're not. And actually, as, as you all have taught me, you know, there are, there are many, and in fact, different definitions of what it means to be mentally well, what it means to be, yeah. you know, in, in, a, in a state of well-being. So I don't know if yeah. you want to say one or two things about that, and I'll move us on. And I'll just remind our audience again, we're going to get into Q&A here in just a couple of minutes. So if you have questions, um, submit them now so we can take a look and make sure we get to as many of them as possible. Thank you for that. So, Ronnie. Yeah, um, I also, to your point, also um, about mental health care, you know, I think that, you know, there are so many different ways to experience mental well-being, mental health, you know, and all those different facets. You know, we are all individuals, individual people with our own lived experience. There are also so many ways of individualized and collective care, sometimes that go in tandem, you know, which is, which is a bit of a crazy, you know, yeah, thing to um, like <laughs> intersect, but, mm -hmm. you know, you can have a group of people that, you know, uh, writing feels the best for me. Writing is what helps me the most. Well, writing doesn't help me as much, but this other group of painters, that's what helps me the most, you know? And, you know, intersecting that into just like, okay, well, you guys both like art. Right. Let's hold space for just all these different types of art practices to promote healing. Um, right. Yeah, it's it's so important to like hold space for everyone, also hold space for individual needs, and you will find commonalities in that you know, right. just naturally, you know. Um, right. And the community for those who want it. Right. So it's like, yeah. you know, I, maybe the writer doesn't want to share their work, but maybe the painter does. And so to have somebody that they can share that work with, so it doesn't just exist within themselves, you know, yeah. that, that community, again, can't emphasize enough how important it is, um, especially, you know, at, I could kind of rant here, but, you know, how atomized a lot of you know, life has become, you know, post COVID. And so just rebuilding, right. Recommitting to those, those yeah. in-person, you know, brick and mortar spaces, those, 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 that face-to-face -face time and how just important yeah. that can be for so many people. Um, so I'll, I'll try to speed us along here. Cause I know now I'm the one ranting. Um, <laughs> and I don't just want to, you know, I, again, we have kind of a diverse audience, you know, I don't just want to you know, kind of uh, talk about all of this to, to, to funders or other people who are supporting young people, but um, you know, maybe a final lesson. What would you say, you know, you are obviously a um, fantastic young leader yourself. What would you say to other people who are either just starting in their, their leadership or are, you know, not quite leaders yet, but are interested in becoming, you know, young leaders? Yeah. What would you say to them? What advice might you give them? I would say that remember that there is, there's always going to be someone that believes in you that believes in what you are pitching and what you want to do. There is always someone that will believe in you. There is always someone that is that is looking for you. You know, you might be the missing piece to someone's huge puzzle. You know, I think that, you know, also like there can never be too many youth programs. There's a whole lot of youth in the world, you know, right. like <laughs> any, all these different approaches of promoting, you know, you know, wellness and, and health and, and just, just space for youth is, is, is so important. And there will always be someone who will be in your corner. You just have to find them or they have to find you a little bit of both. You know, um, I, it would, it's, it would be such a shame for someone who has such brilliant ideas or an organization who has brilliant ideas to be discouraged because they think no one, no one else is out there looking or wanting that, you know, there are, if you're, you know, specifically talking, if you are, you know, looking to become a, a youth leader, you know, have some sort of youth program, like there will always be someone in your corner. There will always be a youth or, or just a group of youth that are like, 
that's exactly what I need. This is exactly what I'm looking for. Please, you know, it's just getting yourself out there, pitching, pitching what you are doing to, you know, the world and seeing what, what comes upon you. Cause it, it will be amazing. Absolutely. Um, and <laughs> yeah. the last thing I'll add to that is one of the things we've, we've learned at Stonely. So again, Stonely funds fellowships. We're often working with people in leadership positions. Um, and what we've seen time and time again, is that there is no such thing as like a cookie cutter definition of a leader. You know what I mean? One leader who's perfect for this situation, for this organization, you know, might be a terrible fit for, for another situation that's happening over here. And so, right. you know, uh, if, if you, you know, as you're stepping into your leadership, um, part of what makes you a leader, right, is, is finding that match, right, between your, your passion, your strengths, and the work that you um, can do and want to do. So hopefully that makes sense. Now I'm going to transition us over to Q&A here because there's several excellent questions. Um, and I think I'm just going to run through them from start to finish. So again, final call. If you have any questions for Avani, now's the time to submit them. Um, and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so first one here comes from uh, Lisa Kidd as a trainer of a youth serving organization. Um, I would love to learn more about how our participants can be involved with CRY. We are the Drexel Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice. So this might be a great part to plug in. You know, how can people reach out or connect with you if, if they want to yes. talk to you after this? Um, well, if you would like to connect, you can email to me personally um, at avani91302 at gmail.com. If you want to, you know, just learn more about our organization in general, you can email uh, cry.creativeresco at gmail.com. Um, or you can check out our Instagram at cry.collective, um, where we post all of our events, you know, all of our happenings um, there and also support plenty of other organizations there as well. Um, if you are looking to, you know, learn about other uh, youth orgs in Philly. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, yeah. Ivani. And for everybody who's attending here today and everybody who registered, we'll include links to things like Cry's Instagram and in the follow-up email. So don't worry, we'll make sure that you get that information. Yeah. Um, next question comes from... Lee Carson, are there any specific services or projects that you or your team members want to implement, but you just don't have the resources, right? The funding to make it happen. Mm. So funny enough, that learn, play and rest model is one of the things that we don't have the funding for yet, hopefully soon. Um, but we really, we really want to have a cohort of youth that are um, dedicated to being in our space to learn, you know, whether that's learn about, you know, specific activism uh, movements or learn about specific art practices or learn about, you know, any of those things in conjunction with mental health specifically, um, you know, have it be a little youth led, not a little entirely youth led and self guided in that way. Um, that's something that we really, really want. We want to be able to hold um, multiple days in our current space. Hope, uh, hopefully expand within the building that we're currently in um, at Asian Arts Initiative. Shout out them. They're an amazing building and just place. If you haven't been there, please check it out if you're in Philadelphia. Um, and that's where we're housed. Um, we, yeah, we really want to implement that. I believe we want, you know, a cohort of 15 youth dedicated to doing that. And then um, we have, you know, other facilitators and youth organizers and just, teachers coming through um, to share their knowledge, to share their knowledge if it's relevant to what the youth want to learn about. And then, you know, at the end of that cohort, you know, they can decide what project they want to do, whether it's, you know, another art exhibition, or maybe they want to make a podcast, which Cry has done in the past, or maybe they want to, you know, do a really long project that will actually, you know, hands-on impact their community. Um, you know, the, I mean, the possibilities are endless, you know, who knows what, what the youth will want to do because they're amazing. Um, yeah, but that's something we really want to implement because I, you know, we love our current like art cafe, which is leaning more into our play and rest, you know, it allows that space allows for so much joy and so much relaxation. Um, but we also want to have dedicated time to folks who do want to, you know, have a study group or just like mm -hmm. have a dedicated, you know, structure. Because some youth do, some folks, youth, whoever, like structure in that way, you know. So having a bit of structure, a bit of looseness, and have it mingle in between is is where we want to go. <laughs> Fantastic. Absolutely. So this one is just a little bit of a curveball, but I think it's a really important question to ask. 
Um, yeah. If you don't have an answer, that's completely fine. If you don't want to answer it here now, we can also answer it after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. This one comes from Julie McIntyre. She says, thanks for this inspiring work. Um, how do you approach possibly sticky situations with having an open and accessible space for young people? For example, um, and the example she gives is if somebody has used drugs before they come um, or something like that, how do you think about you know, engaging with those young people? How do you think about it with other facilitators? And how do you kind mm -hmm. of, you know, just make sure that doesn't become too much of an issue. If you, if you don't have that issue at all, you know, that might also be. Yeah, we, we have never had that issue, but thank you for asking this question because it is something that should be thought about. Um, yeah, we've never had any issue like that. There have been moments in the space where, you know, say some youth will, you know, get into it a little bit, um, whether that's in person or, you know, never anything physical, thank goodness. But um, usually the way that that has been handled is, you know, we're all learning. <laughs> um, I know when I was a youth, like we had a moment like that. So I can't entirely speak to it um, because I wasn't, you know, in a position of power back then. But um, it felt great the way it was handled. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak more to it than that. But this is like a really wonderful question that I'm going to bring back to my team so that we can figure out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so we'll have copies of all, you know, we won't be able to get to everyone's comments. There's a handful of comments here, but uh, Avani, we'll make sure that we both have access to those after the fact. And and Julie, feel free to, you know, connect with Avani and the rest of the CRI team to talk about that more as mm. well. Um, <laughs> next question here comes from Andre. What are some ways that youth serving or orgs um, can learn how to authentically engage with young people. And I'll add a little bit to this and just say like, particularly youth serving orgs that are led by adults. How can they mm. learn how to engage with their young people? Mm. Mm. Youth serving orgs that, orgs that are led by adults, I think it goes back to having to trust young people. It really does. I think that um, it is important to see the youth that you are interacting with, not as, you know, youth, but as like your peers, you know, like you are, you are there to support them. They are there to support themselves and you like it's when you're in an organization involving youth, it should just be a, a, a full on, just like support bowl of, 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 of folks, you know? Yeah. I think, can I know. ask you, well, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, go on. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, can you give us one or two examples of what that, right? When you say trust young people, what yeah. is a concrete example of what that looks like? Cause some people might say, oh, I do, but they, the behavior doesn't feel. change, right? Right, right. Trusting young people looks like um, something that I said earlier in this this um, webinar. Oh my goodness, I'm trying to recall back to it. No worries. Uh, <laughs> and we can always answer it after the fact, right? If you don't. Yeah, know. yeah. Oh my goodness, I'm drawing a total blank. Ooh, don't even worry me. about it. We will address <laughs> that in our follow up. So not. Yeah, even yeah. Um, let's see here. So one more, um, yeah, we have time for one more question. Um, and again, you know, no names or anything like that, but do you have any success stories of maybe one or two young people um, that have grown as a result of engaging with CRY? Um, and particularly, what do you think about the CRY model that helped them the most? Um, yeah, well, I have several, but one I will talk about, again, no names, but um, I wasn't involved at the beginning of this youth story, but when I when I came into the picture um, after I moved back from New York, um, not much had changed since when you know they had first started, and they were so shy and they did not really talk much. You know, we would gather up in a circle and do check ins, and they you know would be like, "I'm fine," you know, "I'm I'm okay," like you know, um, and then they're around the time of the exhibition, we always, you know, have had a panel of the youth where, you know, the audience can ask youth questions and they can talk about their experience at CRY and how it shaped them. And I remember specifically right before the panel, this person asked if they had to talk. And I was like, no, you don't, if you don't want to talk, you don't have to, you know, this is, you know, if you want to pass on a question, you can. And they got up there and answered every question and they not only just answered every question, but were so full of light when they answered the questions, they had so much to say. And I, you know, kept my composure on the stage, but I was just like, oh my God, they're like, they're so in this, <laughs> this is incredible, you know? Um, and, you know, we saw through their work, they just, they had so much to say, right? We saw through everything that they had so much to say, but just didn't know how to say it. And so 
having that final, you know, closing panel, that hurrah moment of them being like, I'm going to say it all here. This program yeah. rocks. I've, I've grown in this way and I've evolved in this way. It was, oh my God, it, it was so heartwarming. It still is to this day. It was just incredible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so thank you to all who submitted questions. Again, if we didn't have time to get to yours, we will try to do that after the fact. Um, to those of you who submitted comments as well. Um, but we are going to go ahead and wrap up here. Um, let me just make sure I get everything we want to talk about. Here we go. Um, so Avani, first off, thank you so much for all of your thoughts and wisdom today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's always such a joy speaking with you and learning from you, you know, again, um, I think I speak for everyone at Stonely when I say we've already learned so much from our, our, our work with Creative Resilient Youth. Um, we look forward to seeing what you do over the next year. Uh, before I let you go, do you have any, again, other upcoming events, news, or anything else that you want to plug? Um, for people in the audience to watch out for? Um, yeah, well, I mean, keep an eye on our Instagram if you have any youth um, around. Uh, definitely, they can come through every Thursday um, from 4 to 7 p.m. at a Asian Arts Initiative in Studio E. Um, I think tomorrow we are having a potluck. If anyone, you know, any youth or anyone is able to come through, we're going to have a lot of food in the space, music. Um, we're going to have a few fun activities. Um, it's like a late Valentine's Day um, <laughs> celebration because we we missed it. But, um, you know, still wanting to connect with folks in that way. Um, we also have, um, I, I mean, honestly, the best way is to stay tuned on our Instagram or, you know, reach out to us via email. But we do have, you know, um, seasonal clothing swaps uh, in order to, you know, reach youth who maybe have, you know, winter clothing needs or they need more clothes for spring. And it kind of allows um, folks to get their needs met for free, you know, allows some folks to get rid of access. Um, yeah. Yeah, enormously helpful. It's very cold out there. Yes, um, it is. Today, so. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, yeah, so, and then just on Stonely's part, we have another exciting youth partnership spotlight coming up with the Young Artist Program in March. Um, we'd love to see you there if you're able to make it. We'll be sending out more news about it through our newsletter soon. Um, we're also recording this webinar. We will share it with you all in the coming days. We'll have it up on, on Stonely's website and YouTube page. Um, and if you missed our previous Spotlight webinars with Urbed and the Youth Art and Self-Empowerment Project, those are up on the YouTube page as well, as well as many videos featuring the work of our fellows. Um, so with that, thank you again, Avani. Thank you to our audience um, for joining us and please have a wonderful rest of the week. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>